to welcome you to this uh, beautiful day to come. And, and first of all, I want to commend you for being in church, inside, when it's so nice outside. So thank you for coming and worshiping with us this morning. Just a uh, couple of announcements before we go on. Um, if you haven't had an opportunity on the back counter, there are some church directories that are, that are there. And so feel free to take one for your family. You can kind of check on it. As, as always, directories are as good as they come off the press for 30 seconds. And then things are going to change or things are crushed. If you see something you need to change, let us know in the, in the church and we'll get that taken care of. Yeah. Um, spring cleanup. It's getting to be that time of year. And so April the 9th, we're going to plan a, a time of cleanup here at the church. Uh, we'll have a regular men's Bible study at 8 o'clock. And then following that, we will gather to kind of spruce up the outside, spruce up the inside. Easter is April 17th, which is three weeks away, hard to believe. And so we want to be preparing for that on Easter Sunday. You'll also notice there's baby bottles at the back. Now, that's not just to put some you know, coffee in and drink, pretend you're just drinking milk. But um, they're out there for Life Choices Family Resource Center. Life Choices does every year in the spring. They do a baby bottle fundraiser for their ministry. Uh, they minister to women and men. Uh, who are going through an unplanned pregnancy. Uh, they do a lot of really good work out there at Life Choices. And so if you'd like to support them, you can take a baby bottle, kind of like Alabaster offering, you put your change in it, and then on Mother's Day we collect them and turn that in, and that helps them as they carry out their ministry. So they're sitting on the back counter as well. Tomorrow night, Women's Craft Night. Uh, it's going to be taking place. Carla Moore is going to be leading. You've probably seen the picture scrolling behind me at some point in time. I don't know where that is on the slides. Uh, it comes around there. So... Uh, if you have any questions, Carla's here in the front row. You can talk to her about any information you have regarding that. That's 6.30 tomorrow night here at the church. And of course, men's Bible study. We've been having a wonderful time together. Uh, on Saturday and yesterday was just a really good study and a really good time together in the Lord. So uh, in two weeks, then again, we'll be meeting for the men and the ladies every Monday um, at 11 o'clock. Our meeting for their time of study as well. So we encourage you. Uh, to connect there. Also, uh, if you're interested in membership, um, we've kind of worked through most of that, so if you guys have kind of gone through that or if you missed a study, we'll meet right after church uh, in the same room here, the first door to the right down the hallway uh, for those that are interested in membership. And then, of course, Bible study follows afterwards down the fellowship hall as well. So a lot of opportunity uh, to connect with one another and also to um, grow in the Lord. Well, it's a really good opportunity this morning. We always it's a blessing whenever someone from Ranch comes and testifies and has graduated. Dave is doing that today, so uh, I'm going to uh, invite him to come up here. And I'm going to, actually, I'm going to get your microphones and move you back to the back. So I'll bring one up here for you, and we're going to listen to, to Dave. Good morning. Good
About two weeks later, um, I think the three people came from the church to pay them a visit, and uh, we didn't know at the time that it was worth it to pay visitors, first timers to the church. Uh, so we invited them in. Um, they presented the gospel to us and asked if we'd like to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Um, and they mentioned this verse, Romans 6 23, you know, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal. So I knew this place was the place I needed to be. Um, I had to come first and then, uh, even though I was in this big effort. Um, so this, we, we do talk groups every day and have open doors. And uh, let's go through some Proverbs verses. And came across one, Proverbs 22, 19. It says, so, so that you trust, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I have instructed you, even you. 
processed drugs don't particularly much better than drinking alcohol, which I do wish I should have stopped at this point. Um, well, I can see it for the worst, obviously. So, that said, I, I know the real head won't be easy, but I want you to know that if I'm grounded, grounded in God, um, in His work, along with prayer, fellowship, giving, and just food, I can win.
about what we receive, but in reality, it's about what we give to God. It's about offering ourselves to Him, seeking after Him, allowing Him to, to fill our lives. And it's so hard in these days. There's so much distraction, so much noise that just kind of hammers at us all the time. But when we push that back and we fix our eyes on Jesus, He is the one who brings peace and hope in a world. And when we seek after him as the deer pants after water, we can find refreshment in him.
Sometimes we just don't know which way to go or what to do. But Lord, you are the one who promised that you would go with us through whatever valley is ahead of us. Lord, you promised that you would lead us through the valley of the shadow of death, or we would fear no evil. Or we fear no evil because you, our shepherd, are with us. So Lord, today I pray that whatever valley people are going through this morning, whatever circumstances are just right in front of their face, Lord, I pray that they would be reminded that you are with them, that you will never leave them nor forsake them, that, Lord, as they lean upon you, just as Brother Dave shared this morning, as, as he gave himself to you, Lord, you provided the opportunity and the grace and strength that he needed. Lord, we know that you can do that for any one of us. You can do that for any one of us. And so, Lord, today we pray, lead us through this valley. Lord, we pray for the conflict in Ukraine. Lord, I pray for just an end to the violence. I pray for peace in that area of the world. And Lord, I pray for comfort and help and care for all of those who have been displaced and whose lives have been traumatized because of what has taken place. Lord, we can't even begin to imagine how many of those people feel. But Lord, you love them like you love us. And you're with them Lord, like you're with us. And Lord, as, as servants of yours walk into that area and minister to people in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that your light would be seen and your hope and your grace and your strength would be found in the lives of those who literally lost everything. Lord, I pray today that you just would be salt and light in the midst of all that darkness. And Lord, I pray here in our own world, in the midst of all the darkness that surrounds us and, and decisions that are made on political levels and personal levels that just seem to, to just bring darkness. Lord, we pray that you would show light, that your Holy Spirit would lead us and help us, Lord, to be the light of the world you promised, and that, Lord, we might indeed lift you up that others might see you. Lord, we also pray today that you would be with these needs. Lord, we pray for Catherine Zoe and, and Jim and Brecken and Jenny and Judy and Ty and Mark and Analia and Olivia and Steve and Bob and Dave and Peggy's neighbor and Christy and Melody and Paul and Lila and Dan. Lord, we just lift all of these, these names that we have listed for you to lift them up. You know their heart, Lord. You know, you know their situations. We pray that you bring healing to their bodies and grace to those who care for them. Lord, we 
would also pray today that you would be with those who shall remain. We thank you, Lord, for Dave's graduation today. We thank you for what he's doing in his life. And we pray, Lord, for more brothers that Tim always has had. I pray for those who would come and find healing and grace in the midst of the study of the Calvary. I can always pray for running in circumstances in front of him. And Lord, you know those. And we pray that you would give him victory and wisdom as he walks forward. Lord, I pray that for all of us. Give us victory, give us wisdom, give us peace, give us strength, give us grace. Give us everything we need to live for you in this world that we live in today. And Lord, we invite you to speak to us. We invite you to, by your spirit, to connect in our lives. And Lord, may you do that which only you can do. For as we lift you up, we pray that you would draw us to yourself. In Jesus' name. ourselves and we have not noticed. 
As I began this um, series of messages as we prepare to head towards Easter, I was asking, Lord, what is it you want me to say? You know, we've done a lot of different things this week. We, we focused on the cross over several Sundays, preparing for Easter and the resurrection. We, we, we focused on a lot of different things. But this time, the Lord gave me three words. Pray, fast, give. And I talked about that a few weeks ago. I kind of hit the, the highlights, if you will, on some of those. And then on these last few weeks, we're going to dig down a little bit deeper. And today's one that probably you don't hear often. Uh, we don't talk about that in our affluent society. And that is, how do we fast in an affluent culture? How do we deny ourselves in a culture that says you deserve it today? So I want you to think with me today. First of all, I want to ask you this question. You don't have to answer this publicly, okay? Do you ever get hangry? I hear that some of you do. Now maybe that was your spouse uh, snickering under their breath. Maybe that was somebody around you that are aware. I, I know that if I was to say that, that would happen in my household. They would say, oh, just go eat a Snickers. Uh, you need something to kind of get you going. Um, one person did this. They said at least twice a year, my family threatened to give me a t-shirt or a coffee mug with sayings like hangry, a state of anger caused by lack of food creating irrational and erratic emotions, or I'm sorry for what I said when I was hangry. <laughs> you, know, you just wear the shirt, you don't have to worry about uh, saying the words. Here, here's some of the symptoms that we find ourselves in, and if I preach too long, maybe that's why you are at the end of the service. Um, bad temper or irritable as a result of hunger. Self-control is MIA. Um, you snap at people around you. Uh, little things feel like the end of the world. You know, that pencil lead broke, and it just went crazy. Um, melodramatic doesn't begin to cover it. You can't stop thinking about food. You envision stealing other people's food. <laughs> and even food that's not well made looks good. You see, I'm talking about what takes place with us when we don't have the sustenance, we don't have the, the food in our bodies that we normally receive. Now maybe some of you have, have tried to, to not drink coffee over a period of time and, and you understand what that's like, or you've, you've tried to um, not eat sugar over a period of time. Whatever it is, you recognize that the deprivation of that, the loss of that, brings about in your life some symptoms that remind you that there is a little bit of dependency there. You know, we sometimes think you look at dependency as such things as alcohol and drugs and those kind of things, but there's 
other things which we depend on rather than on God. Now, when I came today, I, in fact, we were having a praise team, and I'm not going to say who said this, but I said something about fasting, and it kind of just, what do we do? You know, in that process, you know, fasting is not something we talk about. It's probably not in your top ten things that you plan to do today, or maybe even this year. Now, some of you might fast on a regular occasion. I don't do it enough. But fasting is one of those things the Scripture teaches us. It's one of those things that helps us to engage with Christ. So I'm going to read a portion again of what uh, Emily read for us. It says, When you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Have you ever been around somebody that just says, you know, they're looking like they're doing really good, and then all of a sudden you walk in and you're like, oh, man, life is terrible. You know, that they just want you to know that it's bad. You know, it doesn't feel that bad at the moment, but if you're there, they want you to know it's bad. He says, truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. Now, I'm assuming that you washed your face this morning. Uh, I don't know about the oil on the head. That might be a little different, you know. Um, you know, if you're missing some hair up top, like I'm headed that direction, maybe I'll do it on top just to, to shine it up a little bit. Um, but, you know, in other words, just make yourself up. Get yourself ready for the day. He says, because you're fasting is not to be obvious to others because that's not who you're trying to impress. But rather you're seeking to engage with your Heavenly Father who is unseen and who sees what's going on inside in secret and will reward you. So today, I noticed in this passage of Scripture that Jesus said, when you fast. Now that's three words. I want to take a little bit of time with you. When you fast. He didn't say if you fast. He didn't say you must fast. He just said simply when you fast. Now, to me, that says that that's a part of the life of the people who he was teaching. It was a part of the life of the people around him that fasting was a normal aspect of their life. Now, now fasting is more than a fillet of fish on Friday. Uh, it's more than just simply uh, choosing to adjust something. It, it, it's connecting with God. So, so fasting was a part of life. Jesus spent 40 days beginning his public ministry, fasting. Now, and I think the most obvious words in Scripture that says, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and it simply says, and he was hungry. You know, I mean, that, that, that's pretty obvious in that process. Jesus spent the time fasting. Here's the simple definition of fasting this morning. Fasting means to lay aside any pleasurable and or vital activity for a period of time in order to intentionally pursue God and know his mind with the intent of obeying his revealed Will. In other words, fasting is not about losing weight. It's not about somehow getting yourself healthy and getting yourself right. It's about pursuing God, knowing his mind with the intent to do it. You see, when you read scripture, Jesus, when he prepared for his ministry, intended to know the Father's mind. And his intent was to do it. So if we're going to fast today, it's not just that I can check it off my list and say that I've done it. I came across a thing last night that said, you know, we always talk about bucket lists. Uh, there's another not bucket list, like things you don't want to do again. You know, we don't want to put fasting on that, something we don't want to do again, but we do want to pursue God's will. So here's some things I want to share with you this morning. I'll try to work through them uh, fairly quickly. Today. Number one, keep your fast secret. In other words, when we're, when we're fasting, unless we're doing something as a group together, basically, nobody needs to know. It's kind of like those military plans that need to know basis. The need to know is you and your Heavenly Father. We're doing this for spiritual things, not for the purpose of gaining a spiritual reputation. You see, when you look at the Pharisees in, in the New Testament, they wanted a spiritual reputation. So they would choose to fast and pray in our context on Main and Townsend so that everybody could see that they were praying and fasting. They put little things on their clothes so the bells would ring and people would know, here, here comes a holy person. Don't miss out on a holy person. You know, that's not what fasting is about. Fasting is something between us and the Lord and we keep it secret. Now, um, if you're a believer and somebody invites you out to a meal while you're fasting, you might simply tell them, I'm fasting. I need to take a rain check and just leave it there. So you don't have to explain why. You don't have to say what's going on. Just, just tell them that. If you're invited out to lunch by somebody who's not a believer, just tell me I have other plans.
when you've got a previous engagement with someone, Jesus. And so you can't go to the meal with them. Whatever it is, keep it secret between you. The point is not to broadcast it, to show in order that others that make you look good, but rather is a relationship with God. And this can go in a lot of places. Now I'm talking about fasting this morning, but we don't pray publicly to make ourselves look good. Like, hey man, that guy can pray good. Okay, good, he's a good prayer. You know, or uh, he's a good speaker. You know, we don't do that to impress other people. Our life is a relationship with the Lord. So here's the second thing this morning. Understand why you're fasting. It says here, your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Why do we fast? Now on the back of your sheet this morning, you picked up coming in, there's some lists of some things of reasons that we fast. We tried to put some scriptures with some of it. But here's a few reasons why we might choose to fast. Number one, we choose to fast to humble ourselves before God. God delights in listening to and answering the prayers of his people. But fasting helps us to come back to the idea that God is gracious in his dealings with us and we honor God with our humility. In other words, we don't show up in God, God's house and say, hey, aren't you glad I showed up? You know, we come in a in sense of humility. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he might lift you up in due time. God opposes the proud. We were discussing in Bible study yesterday that some of the struggles that we as men have has to do with our own pride. Our own, our own sense of wanting to be in charge of our lives and make sure we don't have to depend upon anybody else because we can depend upon ourselves. And then we find out rather quickly we can't depend on ourselves. We really need God's help. And so, so part of this sense of fasting is humbling ourselves for God, reminding us that what we receive from Him is given by His grace. It is a gift, unmerited, unearned, undeserved. The, the gift of salvation is unmerited and undeserved. The gift of His Spirit is unmerited, undeserved. All the blessings in our life that we have and we take for granted every single day are unmerited and undeserved. You see, we don't receive God's favor the old-fashioned way, earning it. No, we receive God's favor by His grace because of what Jesus did on the cross. So fasting reminds us, it helps us to humble ourselves before the Lord. Secondly, we fast to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us from God's Word. When we're humble, we're more open to the Holy Spirit teaching us something we've never learned before in Scripture. And not only can we learn something, we can learn how to make it a real part of our lives. You see, that's an important part. It's one thing to memorize Scripture. It's another thing to incorporate it into your living. It's one thing to know what God says. It's another thing to make what God says a part of how you live your life. That you order your life around God's word to you. And part of the, the process of fasting is to set ourselves apart so we can hear and understand God's word. And we do that with the help of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 16, beginning verse 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. Now, isn't that good to know? Even the disciples, Jesus said, I have much more to say to you, but you can't handle it right now. It's more than you can bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he'll guide you into all truth. He'll not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears, and he'll tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. The Holy Spirit, does, the Holy Spirit is not on a maverick mission. The Holy Spirit takes what God the Father has said and through his word and makes it known to us. He is applying that to our lives. The Bible is not just a book or a collection of books. It is the God-breathed word of God. And it can only be understood with the help of God. You see, sometimes I've had conversations with people, and, 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 you, and you talk to them about something that seems very simple in God's word, and it goes right over the top of their head. They just don't get it. Now, don't worry about that. Don't stress out on that. Don't try to argue him into a corner. Trust the Holy Spirit because he's the one that's going to take the word of God and reveal it to their heart. Um, one of the things I've always realized about the Lord, and we talked a little bit about it before you this morning, is sometimes God gives us his word, and then maybe I try to remember the address where it's at and look it up. It's a good thing to know how to do that. I'm not saying you shouldn't know the Bible and know where the things are. But the Holy Spirit doesn't say, go study John 3.16. No, he says, for God so loved you. God's word. And when we take
take time to fast, we open our heart and our mind to dig deeper into the riches of Scripture and understand who God is. Number three, fasting allows the Holy Spirit to show us our true spiritual condition. Psalm 139, 24. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, sometimes we think fasting is about convincing God to do it my way. Convincing God to, to line life up the way I think it ought to be instead of letting God, the Holy Spirit, look at me and say, oh, buddy, there's a problem here. You know, you remember when Paul Thursday says, Houston, we've got a problem? You know, well, sometimes the Holy Spirit says, hey, buddy, you got a problem. We need to have a conversation. And in, during our fasting time, it enables the Holy Spirit to begin to look at it. I like um, the way that they put it in the message. And I put it up here because I, I like what it says, investigate my life, O oh God. Find out everything about me. Cross-examine and test me. Get a clear picture of what I'm about. See for yourself whether I've done anything wrong. Then guide me on the road to eternal life. You see, what we're saying here is we're letting God on the inside. We're letting him shine his flashlight around in places that maybe we don't go. And in the backs of closets where things are kind of stuck there. Um, Kim rearranged my side of the closet this week. Uh, she went in and, and she's always coveted. I'm, I mean, she always wanted <laughs> my side of the closet, at least the corner, because, and she's right, I have clothes there that I don't wear. I probably couldn't even fit in there, some of them, they've been there that long. And so she's always, why can't we just go there? I have extra clothes. Isn't that right, guys, that your wives have extra clothes, always have extra clothes? Uh, but so she wanted to part of my closet, and so we've had this conversation for a while. The other day, she just did it. <laughs> I, I see her coming down the stairs with a bag of clothes, and I realize they're mine. <laughs> yeah, they're mine no, she just took the clothes I don't wear, put them out in the garage, and put her clothes back to where she wanted them to be. <laughs> the place where I never go. Now, the reason I told you that story is not to just say that Kim cleaned up the closet, which she probably could do more of that, and I'd be better off. There are places in my closet I don't go. Stuff's been in there for a long time. If you'd ask me what's there, I wouldn't have a clue. Some of it's probably no good anymore. There's places in our lives that we don't know. There's places in our lives that we don't invite the Lord into. There's places that we kind of push back to the corners, and, and there's things there that just need to be gotten rid of. They need to be dealt with. They need to be cleaned. They need to be cleansed. And when we fast, we invite the Holy Spirit to go there, to do that. Like Kim went into my closet and just did it. We say, Holy Spirit, you have permission. Go to those places. Let's have conversations. Let's find your grace. Let your grace extend further and further into my life in a real basis. So that my life's not just a testimony on the outside, but a transformation on the inside. One of the criticisms that Jesus had to the church in Ephesus in the book of the Revelation was that they had lost their first love. They had been an on-fire group of people when they first came to know Jesus, and they were, they, were, they were so excited they even caused disruption in the community around them. But over time, they'd gotten comfortable. Over time, they'd let things kind of slip in. And it wasn't that they did bad things. It just wasn't that they were on fire for Jesus. They had lost their first love. Spending time with God in prayer and in fasting and in the Word is a good antidote to a dry spiritual life. Just setting it so one of the things that I think that you guys at the ranch appreciate is just because you're there and that's what you're doing. You're soaking in the Word. You're letting God work in your life. And, and because you set that apart and you've got that time there, you have the time to do so. All of us have the time to do so. We just have to create it. We have to create space. Fasting is an opportunity to create that space. When we fast, we enrich our prayer life. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, it says, One of those days, Jesus went to the mountainside to pray, and he spent the night praying to God. Fasting is an opportunity to get real with God in a way that we don't find otherwise. The main reason is to take the focus off of us and focus on meeting God and listening to Him. It's carving out space for God. 
Number five here, it says, when we fast, we're reminded that it's not food that sustains us, but God. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, nor on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he says, he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you, get that, to teach you that man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You see, we get hangry because we don't eat food. We, we stress out about what's going to be on the dinner table. When in reality, God's word is far more nourishing to us than anything that we could eat for lunch. God's word is there. Jesus declared in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. and Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We need to carve out space for God. You see, one of the, one of the temptations in fasting or praying or anything else is we carve out the space and then somebody else fills it. We, we set aside the time on our calendar and something else fills it. And before we know it, we're just doing more stuff even though we carved out the space. Fasting is one of the ways in which we carve out space for God. And as long as we fill it with him and with his word, it's meaningful. And that's my third rule this morning. Deny yourself something meaningful. Fasting is denial of something, and it should be something meaningful. As I said before, fast is not just a filet of fish on Friday. It's something that's going to make a difference. Here's some basic fast. Now, for the most part, the scripture talks about food. Why? We eat food every day. You know, if we don't eat food, we don't survive. So we food's at the center of what we're doing. But there's various ways to fast from food. You might skip a meal. You might do one meal a week. You might do a day a week. You might take an extended time as Jesus did and, and spend seven days. I, whenever I fast it for longer periods of time, uh, there's always that spot when your body says, wait a second, you forgot to feed me. Um, we have two little dogs in our house. I guarantee you they don't want to miss meal time. You know how I know? Because if the girls haven't taken care of it, the dogs come up to me. And they'll go, oh, 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 oh. What are they telling me? Feeding time. You didn't feed me. If you have animals, you understand that. Your animals expect to be fed at a certain time. Our body, we all come to that place where we say, you know what? It's just easier to go down and get a Jimmy John's or a quarter pounder. But when we push through that, when we say no to our body and yes to a commitment to hear from the Lord, God does something inside of us. It's not just a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing when God does something different. If you look at Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 to 15, I'm not going to read it this morning. It's a whole conversation that Daniel has when they've been captured and brought down to Babylon. And, and you know, they were getting the king's food. Now, king's food's probably good because he wanted to feed them well. And Daniel said, but there's some of that stuff we can't eat. And so instead of just saying, well, we're captive, we'll eat whatever they put in front of us, you know, kind of like kids, you know, I made it, you're going to eat it, you know, that kind of thing. Daniel said, but, but what if we did this? And he offered him a diet. It was in there, it talks about different foods to eat vegetables and things that were kosher and those kind of things. And he said, if, if it doesn't go good, then I'll eat your food. But if God honors it, then we'll do this. And so they did. They spent some time. They just ate the food that Daniel talked about. And, and he and his friends were doing better than the other guy eating the other food, the regular food. So you know what happened? Instead of all that ice cream and all that other stuff that they were getting, they got Daniel's food because he was doing better. You see, Daniel honored God. He said, this is what I want to do. So I'm not telling you to do that particularly, but I'm just saying, hear what God's saying. He does something. Sexual intimacy. It's one of the other places in which fasting is referenced in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, Don't deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your self-control. It's just one of the ways it's referenced. So I wouldn't be faithful to the Lord without mentioning that. It's one of the ways that we set that aside to pray. Here's some other things that come up. Media, internet, social media, TV, cable, radio, magazines, newspapers. You know, I, I found out that a good break from the news is good for the soul. <laughs> you know, if you, if, you turn, if you turn off your news channel and don't listen to it for a while, you all of a sudden you feel better. Maybe I wonder they want me to not feel good. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll go there another day. 
But um, the question is, this is who I am. Am I willing to abstain from that for a period of time? Not just to abstain from it, but to focus on God. To let God become the center of what's going on. For him to talk to me. If I'm always just sitting and the television is running, and it doesn't even have to be bad TV. It can be good TV. You can get stuck doing Wordle for a long time. I don't know if any of you do that or not, but it, it's one of those things. You get stuck on some kind of solitaire or internet game. And you could be talking to Jesus. And you could be having to engage in a conversation with him. And here's the one, and I almost didn't put this one in here. But then the Lord said, yeah, you need to. What holds you? What's got a grip on you? What determines the way you act and live? You know, we, again, we put the, the, the big things up there, you know, alcohol, drugs, those kind of things, we put that up there. And things. But what other things have a connection that you just have to do it because that thing or that substance or that show or that relationship says, this is the way you're going to live your life. And it begins to peel you away from God. So that, that, that's for you to decide. Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Notice how Paul does that. He doesn't come up with a list of the top ten things you shouldn't do. He says, no, focus on this. If you invest your time focusing on these good things, those other things will eventually fade away. That brings me to my last rule. Fill your time with prayer. It should go without saying, but it really doesn't. You see, we can fill our time with a lot of stuff. In Matthew 26, Jesus said, going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, it's not possible. May this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Think about it. We've all been in places where we were really intentionally grabbed by what was happening in our life. It was front and center. Maybe it was the loss of a loved one. Maybe it was a, a job decision. Maybe it was uh, something that we needed to do in our finances. Whatever it was, it was kind of like consuming us. And you go talk to your, your friends and they go, oh, have fun with that. They're really not invested in what was invested in you. And you can imagine Jesus praying over the salvation of the world so intensely that he was sweating drops of blood. And he comes back to his disciples who he had said, walk with me, pray for me, hold me up. And he comes back to them and they're snoring. They're disconnected. They're not there. You see, they had all gone to the Mount of Olives Jesus was going to pray. He wanted them to pray with him. He prayed. They fell asleep. We can fill our lives with stuff. It doesn't have to be sleeping. It can be all kinds of things. But if you're fasting to hear God's word, to intensely seek his way with the intent of doing it, don't fill your life with other stuff. Time spent normally doing those things may be fine. But if you're investing in prayer, take the time to spend the time in prayer. If you skip a meal, don't just go do something else. Spend some time with Jesus. If you're setting aside a program, don't just go do something else you think is fun. Spend time with Jesus. Fill your fast with prayer and seeking God. But here's the challenge. The challenge is taking it seriously. It's not just a challenge for fasting. It's a challenge with anything in God's Word. We can either say, well, that sounds like a good idea for the pastor. You know, that sounds like a good idea for those holy people to sit up on the front row. That must be these guys over here. Um, but it's not for me. i got stuff to do. I've got yards to get ready. I've got repairs to do. I've got, I got a list. And so I don't have time to take God Seriously. Now, I'm not going to be critical and, and legalistic and all those kind of things, but the question for us is simply this. Do we want to take God seriously? Does he shape and move our lives, or do we use him for our benefit? You see, fasting is about giving ourselves completely over <coughs> to the Lord. 
Now, if you're satisfied with the level of spiritual life that you have, then wear everything I've said today. But if you're ready for a deeper walk, if you're ready for God to, to be more, more intent and more spiritual, if you're ready to really focus on what Jesus wants you to do, I would encourage you to consider fasting. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Not just your spirit, not just your mind, but honor God with your whole self. Let God fill your life. There's another passage that I didn't, I didn't go into as back in the Gospels. The disciples are wanting to see something happen. Jesus says, even if you, you know, if you have enough faith, you can move a mountain. But then the, at the very end of that conversation, he says, but this kind cometh not out except by prayer and fasting. I think there's some things that fasting is necessary for God to do. It's that sense of, of humbling ourselves before him. It's that sense of, of setting aside and intentionally focusing on him. That when we do that, God can do things that he can't do otherwise with just little arrow prayers. When we say, oh God, would you take care of that? Or God, would you do that? It's when we intentionally focus on him. We set aside whatever it is and we ask God to do something. There's a different level of spirituality there. And I believe God wants us there. I believe God calls us there. He doesn't want us to just float on top of the water. He wants us to go deeper. He wants us to engage in relationship with him and have our lives transformed by him. We are his sanctuary. We are the place where God dwells in this world. I think about Ukraine and I think about all that's going on over there. But in that place, there are people in whom God dwells who take their hands and their feet and they serve people whose lives have just been blown apart in the name of Jesus. We don't have to be in Ukraine. We can be in Montreal. We can be in Delta. We can be wherever God puts us. But we can do it in the name of Jesus, intentionally and on purpose, and let our lives count for him. You see, I don't think God worries about where we plant our flag. I think he's worried about how we live. It's like that scripture that uh, they read earlier, that Mary read. It's not about setting aside a day to go to church and say, hey, I fasted. Am I serving the hungry? Am I caring for those who struggle for a place to live? Am I engaged in the needs of the world around me? In the name of Jesus. If I'm doing that, I believe God wants to call us to places, but we have to first listen. We have to first set ourselves aside so we can hear what God's saying to us with the intent of obeying. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, help us today. Lord, this is one of those things that may set perfectly. It may not be an immediate decision, or you may have already had a conversation with someone today. But Lord, we just want to say to you this morning that we're offering ourselves to you. Lord, help us to, to lay aside food or, or whatever it might be, not just to say that we've done it, not to, to check it off our bucket list, but Lord, help us to truly Make our lives a sanctuary of you, a dwelling place of the presence of God. Lord, may you dwell in us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Let's sing together. Let's just offer ourselves to Lord.
consider setting aside at least some time for God that's not on your agenda of what you want him to do, but rather listening to what he wants you to do, to hear his voice and let him shape and direct your life. If you'll do that, you'll never be the same. God will transform you as you follow him. God bless you this morning. You're dismissed. Don't forget Bible study down the hall and those that are interested in membership will take a bit of time back in that classroom.